Do you believe in skeletons? How would you how would tell people that you're not? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All right, everybody, thank you for being here for this discussion between myself and Nicholas, Proclaimer of Messiah. Um, as you all know, because, I mean, it's my channel and you guys are here, I'm the Dapper Dino. But, Nicholas, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? <laughs> um, fair enough. Um, well, so the uh, format that we had agreed upon was we were going to do 15-minute uh, openers and then a uh, five-minute rebuttal, and then we were just going to uh, go... Oh, Nicholas is muted. Ugh. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, oh, Nicholas, I'm here. if you could... Yeah, but I had you muted on my end. If you could repeat that. Sorry about that. Oh, um... Oh, was was my introduction missed for the yeah. audience? Yeah, sorry, that's my fault. Okay. So, um, I'm Nicholas. I have a YouTube channel by the same name as you see on the screen, Nicholas Proclaimer of Messiah. I'm going to launch into mostly Bible studies coming up here. And I've also done um, some polemics and apologetics, discussions with atheists, that sort of a thing okay. on the channel. Cool. All right. Well, um, like I said before, we you know we're doing about fifteen minutes or so opening, then a five minute rebuttal. Then we're going to launch into a Q and A for a while, and then when there's about forty minutes to a half hour to go, we're going to uh, go ahead, and uh, you guys should be able to hear them now because everything is unmuted. So, yeah. If you still can't, let me know. But um. Anyway, uh, so. I'm, you have something that you would like to present, so I'm going to add that here. So now we can see uh, we had a, a plesiosaur up here. So um, I I think we don't need to stand on ceremony anymore. So whenever you're ready, I'm going to hit start on your first word, and then we will be in the 50 minute countdown. And like I said, but uh, before we were on air, um, you know I'm not going to be like super um, tight fist about this, but I will give you a a one minute warning when you're at 14 minutes. Does that seem fair? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, well, I will mute myself, um, and then you go ahead, so that way, uh, you know, because I'm probably going to, like, type some notes or something. So Okay. So, I have begun. Hello, everybody. Um, the debate today, I think the wording we're going with is are birds dinosaurs? Which, um, I think goes much better for my interlocutor dapper dino here because i think it's pretty clear that dinosaurs are not birds but birds could potentially be dinosaurs um some might think and i'm going to argue that they're not now um here is um about where we're at in the phylogenetic tree as far as dinosaurs as opposed to birds, because here you have birds, reptiles. Amphibians are interesting because there's really only these three kinds of amphibians, but they get their whole own category here. There's no other category here where there's only really three types of something. And um, so I would suppose it's partly a semantic debate, but then also. Um, a scientific debate because as a Christian, I do believe in a young earth and we're not really going to focus on that, but, um, here's a plesiosaur. Here's a dolphin skeleton. I'm showing skeletons because that's what we have for dinosaurs. So, um, they're not so entirely different. I don't know. Um, if, plesiosaurs were possibly mammals or anything. I'm no plesiosaur expert. But here is a sea lion. And then this one, frightening looking thing, is actually a platypus. 
And here you can see um, some of the workings of how the skeleton relates to the rest of the platypus. And so a platypus is a unique sort of animal, um, an egg-laying mammal with um, what looks like a duck bill somewhat. I'm just wondering if we're to see just the skeleton, if um, we would theorize if it was an ancient animal, a platypus necessarily. And then here is a pteranodon. And here's an artist's rendition. Now, um, I kind of picked this one because it looked a little more mammal-like. Um, even though it wouldn't have to look more mammal-like because we don't really know what they were. And that's going to be part of my point about dinosaurs here. But... Um, Then here we are back at, okay, we're at the various categories. I brought that up at the beginning some. Here's a frog. This is an amphibian built for leaping. And then you can see that the other amphibians, the newts, they have the same sort of head as a frog, but they're um, proportioned to different for swimming, but they're actually um, rather similar. I don't know that much about salians, um, Sicilians, these things. Um, I'm pretty sure they're pretty similar to salamanders, but their legs and arms are really tiny. I couldn't tell for sure what skeletons I was looking at when I was gathering the visuals, but here's a reptile. We'll look at a different reptile later, but, um, the turtles are rather unique among reptiles. Um, one of the more unique skeletons of all animals, I would say, um, vertebrates. And then here's a fish. Mammals have a lot of uniqueness among them, right? Um, we looked at a dolphin earlier and a giraffe. That's not on here, but we just see um, elephants, the horned animals. We got all sorts of different mammals. Oh, here's the giraffe. So I hadn't shown it to you yet. Here it is. And then um, now we're in birds. So are birds dinosaurs? Well, this one is a duck. And it's rather unique looking among birds. Ducks are not the most typical looking birds. And then this one's a penguin. They're also pretty unique looking among birds. But what you'll see is you have a bird head, this bird chest thing, and this bird tail down here. And um, same thing here, bird head, bird chest, bird tail. Um, and that's the case with all birds. So here's another penguin more penguin. And this one's not a penguin, but um, it's surprisingly similar, even though um, it might be like a crow or an owl or a dove or something. I just don't know what it is. But it's got the chest thing. The tail is much smaller, but it's got the same kind of thing back here. And the bird head. This is about as close as you would get to um, a dinosaur-like bird. That is a bird that is similar to a dinosaur. And this is an ostrich or an emu or something. And you see it's got much smaller with the chest and bigger with the tail, but still got the bird head, the bird chest, the bird tail. And then this is what's called a terror bird. Um, they went extinct, um, you know, before photography and all that. But um, if you play Final Fantasy video games, this is called a chocobo. And they were a real animal. And um, this is probably um, maybe like seven feet tall, I think. If I'm remembering right, if someone were standing next to it, they'd be a bit shorter than this bird. So pretty frightening thing, but it's got the head, the chest, and the tail. Um, the head is a little more unique than most of them because the beak is so big in the front and all that, but it's still got those bird features. And then here's about as close as you get to a bird-like dinosaur that is a dinosaur similar to a bird. You'll see it has no bird head, um, no bird tail and pelvis and backbone and all that. No bird chest. So although it's similar, sort of like there's um, some similarities between like a plesiosaur and a whale. But um, all the birds are birds and this dinosaur is clearly a dinosaur <clears throat> instead of a bird. Here's another bird-like dinosaur, much larger, but it... um has some of that bird posture to it. 
you know, the little arms that um, can remind us of chickens. Here's um, something like that, but smaller, bird-like dinosaur. This one's less bird-like, but it's still a dinosaur. It um, has dinosaur features. And then this one's also less bird-like, but you can see a little more similarity between it and the more bird-like ones. And this one's clearly a dinosaur, like that one was a dinosaur. This one's a brontosaur. In the Bible, it's a behemoth. And um, yeah, it's not as bird-like, but it's still a dinosaur, just like the bird, the ones that are similar to birds are. And this seems to be a dinosaur. Maybe it's a reptile, <clears throat> or maybe it's both. Um, and then this one is a Komodo dragon. So we got back to reptiles again. And this is more um, typical for a reptile. You know, snakes are a little bit different, but if you take off the arms and legs, there's some similarity there. So the dinosaurs, um, they might be reptiles, and birds are not reptiles. Um, one possible hypothesis would be that birds are dinosaurs. But it's pretty easy to identify birds separately from dinosaurs. So without knowing um, whether things like if they're warm or cold-blooded and um, all the fleshly makeup of the animal, it's hard to determine a final category. So it's not that it's impossible for birds to be dinosaurs, but we don't have the science to say that um, what a bird is is the same type of animal as what this is. Um, we do have birds being so distinctly bird in every case. And then as we go here, this is Archaeopteryx, which is really cool, and um, it appears to be a dinosaur that's similar to a bird, and we can clearly see um, what appear to be feathers, unless they're plumes coming off the limbs. Because this one, that's a tail, so it's not, um, yeah, but we clearly see something here. And it's got really, I don't know if it's just the way it's laid out here, but it looks like it has longer, straighter legs for a dinosaur. But Here's a diagram of one hovering through the air. And it's um, a dinosaur, not a bird. It doesn't have the bird head or the bird tail thing or the bird chest. And this one, um, we'll see if Dapper Dino agrees when he has his chance to respond. But to me, this looks like it could be a realistic Archaeopteryx. Um, it has a shiny face, but there's a lot of animals with cool, shiny features. So that's neither here nor there. But um, it's sort of just like the platypus has what appears to be a duck bill and it's sort of like beaver bodied and then it lays eggs. This one has chicken legs and it's got kind of this flying squirrel cloak thing going on so that it can glide, um, but with feathers instead. But then um, it's a dragon. This is a dragon. It has um, like a reptile type of head. And even though it is very bird-like, the tail reminds me a bit of a possum, if a possum was supposed to fly or something, the way this tail looks. And um, we actually only have the skeleton. But at the same time, um, this has similarities to a bird, but it's not a bird. And then this one I chose for being a bit more mammal or platypus looking too, um, to sort of bias in my favor. <laughs> but um, we see that it's clearly not a bird, even though as it's depicted, this is very similar to a bird as far as dinosaurs go. And then here we are again with a bird. This is a terror bird again. It's got the tail, the chest, and the head. And then here is a bird-like dinosaur. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice. But um, 
This bird-like dinosaur does not have any of the bird features because it's not a bird. This one, um, you can probably tell by now whether or not it has the features, which I am calling bird features, or whether it does not have those features without me having to like um, give my opinion each time. Now, here is an actual bird, but this isn't the most dinosaur-looking bird. But here's one that looks more like a dinosaur. These are ostriches. And um, this one is actually um, a computer graphic. But um, it does look more like a dinosaur, and it looks like a real peacock. So I'm not trying to do an unfair representation. Um, I was going through a lot of pictures, and I actually didn't realize it was a computer graphic at first. But then this one is a real turkey. I chose the one that, to me, looked the most like a dinosaur of the ones I was able to find real quick. And here is a chicken. And as far as birds go, this is probably about the closest to a dinosaur that you get. But this is not a dinosaur. And now it is possible that with the way we define um, birds that we could subcategorize them within dinosaur depending on what dinosaurs are. But my point here is that the skeletal evidence is not enough for us to say that um, birds are within the classification of dinosaurs, nor am I certain that dinosaurs are not reptiles instead. And even though the proportions are a lot different on this Komodo dragon than on, say, this T-Rex over here, um, I still think that they look like they're the same type of animal. Um, just like there's wildly different looking mammals across all ends of the spectrum. So I don't know if we'll get into... Um... One minute. Thank you. Between evolution and creation. Um, the number one reason I would cite for believing the biblical account is because Jesus the Christ was sent to make God obvious. And so that'll sum up that side of my argument, and I'll yield my remaining seconds. Okay, well, thank you very much. I took some notes, so uh, hopefully I can remember what you went over, but I'm going to pull up uh, my presentation. And uh, when I start it, I will start a new timer. Let me uh, restart my timer here. Um, so give me a second, let me pull up this guy here. Okay, so let me double check to make sure everyone can see this. I'm gonna check on my uh, broadcasting software. All right, that's looking good. Nicholas, you're seeing this correctly? Uh, Nicholas, are you? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you'd muted yourself, hadn't you? That's cool. All right. So <clears throat> here we go. I just started the time. So uh, this is, of course, our birds and dinosaurs, a discussion with Nicholas and Dapper Dino. It is sort of a debate structure, but I wasn't sure I really wanted to call it a debate, but that's okay. Oh, there we go. So <clears throat> first, let's talk about archosaurs. Archosaurs are one of the major groups of reptiles. You have for the most part, we have a few exceptions here and there, but for the most part, you have Lepidosauria and Archosauria. Over in Lepidosauria is where you get things like, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, lizard snakes and the Tuatara, which isn't either of those. Of course, snakes are lizards, but that's a different discussion for a different time. So let's say you want to see if an animal is in fact an Archosaur. <clears throat> well, you need to find a few things. You need to find two temporal fenestrae, which are on this here, these two holes here, which are down here on the bird. You want to look for an antorbital fenestra, which is here. This is an opening in the skull, which you can see here. Now, then there's the nares, which is here. So, okay. You also want a palatal process of the maxilla to meet at the midline. Now, you can't see it on these skulls because you'd have to look at, you know, sort of the ventral view, and people don't typically take pictures of the ventral views of crania, so sorry. But birds also have this feature. And and one of the major ways to distinguish lepidosaurs from archosaurs, archosaurs, birds included, lack of parietal foramen, which is an opening at the top of the skull, which lepidosaurs 
retain, and it helps them regulate their circadian, circadian rhythms by allowing light to shine diffusely onto their pineal gland, which then detects that and releases hormones to keep them active and inactive at the right times of day. So <clears throat> from all this, we can tell birds are already archosaurs. So we're well within reptilia, and dinosaurs are also reptiles. Now, here's some more archosaur features. And by the way, guys, I'm going to be holding uh, super chats till at least after the five minute rebuttals. So um, please feel free to send them, but I will be getting to them later. Uh, so birds are archosaurs. So birds use beta keratin in their integumentary structures, which is the same type of keratin that is used in our other archosaur scutes like uh, crocodilians, as well as in lepidosaur scales, whereas mammal integument typically uses alpha keratin for most of its structure. Now, reptiles do also have alpha keratins, but they per predominantly use beta keratins. Also, those birds that did have teeth, because we do have toothed birds, at least in the fossil record, had thecodont teeth, which is a characteristic of archosaurs. In order to be an archosaur, you have to have thecodont teeth. Uh, lepidosaurs, on the other side, have Thorodont teeth, which means their teeth come from a little groove, and in thecodont teeth, each tooth has a particular socket that it grows from. Another key characteristic that is unique to archosaurs is the fourth trochanter. So you can see this trochanter on the bottom of the left-hand bit, which is the femur of a critosaurus, which is a kind of sauropod. And then on the right, you can see it on the left, which is a um, Cathartes aura, which is a, uh, it's a turkey vulture. I would have to double-check, though but it's most certainly a bird. And so this fourth trochanter is a uh, muscle attachment site for the muscle called the caudofemoralis longus, which stretches between the base of the tail and the top of the femur and is the main retractor muscle for uh, archosaurs. It is the way that they pull their leg back and walk forward. Now in birds, the importance of this muscle is reduced because they get most of their propulsive force from below the knee, but it is still there and it is still one of the main retractor muscles for the femur. And it is, in fact, a key diagnostic characteristic for archosaurs. So now we have a pretty well established, based on the anatomical definition of archosaurs, that birds are within archosauria, which is the group that contains dinosaurs as well as crocodilians and their related buddies. But let's specifically zoom in on dinosauria. So if you look at the bottom left of this, you will see two diagrams, and these are simplified diagrams, but they're diagrams of the ankle joint. Dinosaurs have a crocodile reverse ankle, which is what you see on the right of that diagram. So the astragalus and the calcaneum, labeled A and C, do not um, move against each other. They move together with the lower uh, tarsal bones. And you can see that they then also tend not to move relative to either the tibia or the fibula. Whereas a crocodile normal ankle, which is what's typical in most animals, including pseudosuchians, which would include modern alligators and crocodiles, you have the ability of the astragalus and calcaneum to move relative to each other so that the, the foot can swing out in different directions. The crocodile reverse condition gives birds, like all dinosaurs, a hinge-like joint at the ankle, so the foot can only move up and down. It can't move out to the side and it can't rotate. But we also have the syn sacrum. So a syn sacrum, at least in modern animals, is a very unique structure found only in birds. And what happens is a large number of sacral vertebrae, which are vertebrae in the hip area, actually fuse onto the sacral arches, which are the uh, iliac crests that you can see prominently displayed here in an unidentified um, songbird up top hip, and down below a chasmosaurus hip. And chasmosaurus, again, we're going with a sauropod. So I'm trying to pick things that are not terribly bird-like to illustrate these commonalities. So this is actually one of the definitions of dinosaurs. You have to have the syn-sacral structure, and also, importantly, you have to have more than five sacral vertebrae. And I think we can tell right now, just by counting these little arches, which are actually the transverse processes of the sacral vertebrae, that we have a lot more than five vertebrae in either of these sacra. Okay, so dinosaurs, unlike most other reptiles, have a sacral arch that extends both anterior and posterior to the acetabulum. Now, conveniently, we were shown a very nice Komodo dragon earlier, which displayed this, in which it had the iliac crest descending only anterior to the acetabulum. Most reptiles have essentially no anterior extent of the sacrum. Birds also share this trait with dinosaurs. So you can see this in both this Tyrannosaurus and this sort of generalized, you know, uh, Neornithine bird skeleton, where you have the sacral arch at the ilium extending well forward of the acetabulum. All right, dinosaurs characteristically have a small fibula and a large tibia, as can be so seen both in this bird leg as well as this Tyrannosaurus leg. Additionally, derived Salurosaurus, like Tyrannosaurus, 
and both of these animals ultimately have a fusion of the tarsal bones onto the tibia because remember those astragalus and calcanium aren't interfacing against each other so for additional support they can fuse to the uh, tibia and of course this fused bone is called the tibiotarsus something that is found in many dinosaurs including all the ones leading up towards the birds at least in terms of taxonomy and again this is a fairly unique thing to dinosaurs now Birds and dinosaurs both have hard-shelled eggs, and this is not as conclusive as I would like it to be because there is currently some contention as to whether or not hard-shelled eggs are actually uh, basal to dinosauria or if it convergently evolved a few times. But it is the case that only dinosaurs lay, have ever laid hard-shelled eggs that we know of, and birds do it too. But also, in one of the most important aspects, we have the open acetabulum. One of the key characteristics that is extremely unique to dinosauria and one of the ways in which they were first recognized as a unique group that was all part of a single biological unit was the acetabulum which is where the femur sockets into the hip is actually an open ring of bone you can see right through it if all you have is just the hip and you can see that both in this um sort of generalized ornithischian pelvis as well as this uh duck pelvis you see uh, in the duck pelvis where it's labeled AM and has an arrow going down, that's where the acetabulum is. And you can see the acetabulum clearly labeled on an ornithischian pelvis. So birds have this structure too. But let's be more specific. Birds aren't just dinosaurs. They are specifically theropod dinosaurs. Now, you might think of theropod dinosaurs as sort of the two-legged bitey ones, right? They're the ones that go around eating things. Now, that's not actually a completely accurate picture of theropod diversity. There were, in fact, many uh, omnivorous and even herbivorous theropods, but basically they were predatory. So this is something that we hadn't found for a while, but in the past few decades, we've now that we know what to look for, uh, non-bird furcula are showing up. That's the wishbone. So you can see this. There's an arrow pointing to a Tyrannosaurus furcula. The furcula are essentially fused clavicles, and they are unique to theropods. We used to think they were unique to birds, but then we started finding them in more and more theropods. Now, we have the locked radius and ulna. So the radius and ulna in your arm, as a human, allow you, they can move against each other to allow you to take your hand and put it up towards the sky with the palm facing up, or have your palm facing down towards the ground. Theropods can't do this, and neither can birds, because both of them have their radius and ulna locked together for additional strength. Now, we also have the particularly unique avian respiratory system in which the lungs are essentially rigid and airflow is, accom is accomplished through a various numbers of um, air sacs that, can, that are in the neck, in the abdomen, in the limbs, all over the place, even in the bones. And in fact, we now have direct evidence from skeletal traces of numerous uh, non-avian theropods, including Majungasaurus, as displayed here, that Theropods also had this sort of breathing system, and we also even have indication that sauropods, the other side of Sauroschia, also had an air sac breathing system that was almost certainly unidirectional and was similar to the avian style respiration, which is probably one of the things that allowed them to get so big because they had very efficient respiration. And it used to be, before we had a, you know the nice specimens that we have now in all of our scanning electron microscopes and whatnot, that the avian lung system was thought to be a very strange and unique adaptation made by birds, but it turns out, nope, it's actually just a typical dinosaur breathing system. Uh, now we also have the semi-lunate carpal. This is very particular to a group of animals called Manoraptora, and this is the animals that are very close to birds, and including birds. And they have this special bone. Now, if you were to try to rotate your wrist as a human so that the side of your hand where your pinky is was touching, say, the side of your arm where your ulna is, you're not going to get very far. But many Manoraptoran dinosaurs had a special half-moon or half-circle-shaped carpal bone that allows them to actually completely fold their hand against their forearm in that direction. And that is the same bone that is shared by birds, and it's how birds can tuck their wings. And again, this is unique to Manoraptorans, which is a group of theropods. Now, we know that many non-avian, non-bird theropods had feathers. In fact, we saw a few earlier. Archaeopteryx isn't the only feathered dinosaurs. Here we have pictured Anchiornis, Genulong, Podipteryx, Sinoscolopteryx, Sinornithosaurus, Sinoceropteryx, and Eutyranus. And in case we want to get out of theropods and go into Ornithischians, the dinosaurs that are least like birds, we even have feathers here on the far left that is the detail of feathers from Kulindodromius. 
So feathers are still not unique to birds. They're firmly within dinosauria. Dinosaurs have feathers. Birds only have feathers because they're dinosaurs. So now this isn't something that come up, but that came up, but it might in the future, and it's a common uh, creationist talking point. What about Alan Fiducia, who says that feathers are collagen? If these feather fossils that we're finding are actually just collagen. Well, these feathers still contain detailed branching patterns inconsistent with preserved collagen. In fact, they, you can see the rachis and the barbs and the barbules in many of them. Also, collagen doesn't have melanosomes, but preserved feathers do, and we know that. In fact, I picture this restored microraptor gooey showing coloring based on preserved melanosomes and microstructures. So we know it was black and it had an iridescent sheen like a crow. Uh, let's see. We can even tell if the feathers had rufous or black melanin. And we, in this case, we have a Sinusoropteryx prima with banding of white and reddish proto feathers based on finding specifically rufous melanosomes in the feathers in this pattern. So we actually know what color this dinosaur was. Uh, so what has to be done to overcome the conclusion that birds are dinosaurs? It's actually very simple. All you need to do is show that di birds don't have the characteristics that I've said they do, which make them dinosaurs, or find out that birds have characteristics that are those of a different taxon than dinosauria. For example, if they had a parietal foramen, or if their blastopore becomes a mouth in embryonic development. This would, in fact, invalidate most of evolution. So that would really be a great one. But I don't think we're going to get there. Now, I want to um, remove this presentation because it is over, and I want to quickly jump into a few things um, that I was asked. I was asked most specifically um, about a reconstruction of a Archaeopteryx. And I did have some notes. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so the particular uh, reconstruction that you had was a bit inaccurate. Uh, for instance, it lacked the hind wing, or the hind wings for, so basically Archaeopteryx we know had wings on its hind legs in addition to its uh, forelimbs. So it lacked those. Uh, it also has an inverted hallux or big toe. We know that Archaeopteryx did not have that. That was an idea that was prominent because of what essentially turned out to be a taphodomic artifact in the original, yeah, I'll show that, in the original fossil. Um, so this is not the most accurate um, Archaeopteryx, but I don't want to go into that too much. I do also want to say that um, it does seem like my opponent has not really gone the full length of finding out what a dinosaur is in the first place because he displayed a Rausukian, which is in fact a Pseudosuchian, uh, more closely related to crocodiles and alligators than it is to dinosaurs, and portrayed it as a dinosaur. Um, and also, that's, that's the Rausukian, yes. And also seemed to not realize that uh, reptiles are the larger group to which dinosaurs belong. And so there seemed to be some contrasting of reptile versus dinosaur. And so you, we want to think about this in terms of maybe something we're more familiar with. So all mice are rodents, and all rodents are mammals, and all mammals are vertebrates. Similarly, all birds are dinosaurs, all dinosaurs are archosaurs, all archosaurs are reptiles, and all reptiles are still vertebrates. And I think that is going to be it with me, with 15 seconds to spare. All right, so Nicholas, if you would like to jump into your five minutes, um... I am ready when you are. Okay, I'll go ahead and um, jump into it. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. So um, I was paying close attention to the um, anatomical similarities named there. So I think um, what's important, because you listed some ways that your position could be refuted, which um, would be sort of refuting it from your perspective, um, which may be a standard perspective or often what someone else might do. But I think I'm going to um, discuss this from a different approach because um, the reason I brought up the bones is that that's all we have. So I did a lot of showing bones and drawings for non-dinosaurs, but not so much... Um, showing photographs of much of anything until I came to the birds at the end. And I did that intentionally because all we have are the bones. So these dinosaurs are hypothetical. So I do understand that hypothetically, I guess birds are reptiles and dinosaurs are reptiles. Um, of course, I might just be old school and simple, but for me, reptiles are 
cold blooded. And that's a pretty big difference between birds and reptiles today. And when we're looking at something hypothetical, like um, exactly what dinosaurs were, um, then at that point, it's um, assuming the conclusion to some extent um, when describing the categories, which I'm not necessarily saying that Dapper Dino was assuming his conclusion because he's telling you how to think about these categories. So in my model, how one thinks about these categories is that um, on the third day, God made the seeds in the ground. We learn in chapter two that they did not yet grow. Um, they seem to have started growing probably on the fourth day because there was mist. And um, it seems that the heavenly bodies would provide the heat for the mist. Um, might be his way of doing it. Now he was doing things so fast because he was doing things by the day that um, it's a shot in the dark to be um, throwing out conjecture on such details. But anyway, then he made the sea creatures and then he made um, man and um, the land creatures. And somewhere in there, he made um, the sky creatures also. And so it seems to me that um, he would have made these in entire ecosystems at once already. And so then when we have the variety between birds and dinosaurs, if you're assuming there is some um, gradual evolution from here to here, rather than these being created differently, then um, you might think that this needs to come from somewhere, so it would have come from this category. But the way that I would think about it is they're made at the same time, and there's quite a good gap between the dinosaurs that are similar to birds and the birds that are similar to dinosaurs. And so um, I think that does a pretty good job of contextualizing um, why I would say that we do not have the evidence to call birds dinosaurs in my perspective, which is a little different than um, what Dapper Dino outlined for how he could be refuted. And I don't know if I have time left, but I'll yield. Okay, yep, you had about a minute left, so I was actually just about to give you the one-minute warning, so there you go. All right, I will be starting up on my five minutes, so let me real quick just get my notes ready, because I did take notes. That's why I muted myself. That's the biggest reason I muted myself. Um, so <clears throat> let me just, uh, okay, here we go. So uh, this is going to be a rebuttal to my opponent's opening statement in the opening or in the open discussion. I will be more getting into his rebuttal. So let's see. Um, there was a lot of things that I can't help but call nonsense. For instance, we were shown a plesiosaur and a dolphin and a sea lion for some reason, and then a platypus and then Tyrannodon longiceps and asked if they were all similar. But in fact, they're all quite different. And we know very, very, very well which ones are mammals because we know what a mammal is. From a skeletal perspective, mammals have certain particular skeletal characteristics that you don't need the rest of the animal to find. For instance, if you have a dentary squamosal jaw joint, as all mammals do, then you have a mammal. If you have a distinction between thoracic and lumbar vertebrae as opposed to simply dorsal vertebrae, you've got a mammal. Uh, if you have a closed acetabulum, but you have the offset uh, femoral head, that might make it look like a dinosaur, but you also lack that uh, fourth trochanter, you've got a mammal. Uh, mammals are really not very hard to distinguish. If you have distinct heterodont dentition, which includes things like incisors, canines, molars, you've got a mammal. Um, so it's very strange. I, I don't know how we're confusing any of these things for mammals other than simply not knowing the basics about taxonomy. And that continued for quite a while. I was happy to say that with, I think, only one exception, I was able to identify at least the family and usually the genus and species of every animal that you displayed. So that was always fun. Um, so let's see. Uh, there was also a whole bunch of dinosaurs that were shown up on screen and pointed out they weren't birds. But that's the thing. I agree. All birds are more closely related to each other than they are to any non-bird dinosaur. And so every taxon has things that are unique about it that is not shared by closely related taxa. So for instance, birds, many birds, not all actually, have a keeled sternum. And in fact, only neo, uh, neonate birds have the keeled sternum. And so 
paleonate birds, like the tinamou and the ostrich and the uh, other ratites, lack it, as do other non-bird dinosaurs. That's because it's an actual synapomorphy of neonate birds. And so other things like uh, the fusion of wing fingers and things like that are in fact also synapomorphies of aves or birds. So of course they're not shared by other dinosaurs. But the question is, do birds have all the characteristics of the larger taxon dinosauria? The answer is in fact, yes they do. And so by the rules of taxonomy, which is the only way in which this question makes sense, they are in fact dinosaurs. Because remember, dinosauria is a scientific term. The question, are birds dinosaurs, is a question of taxonomy. We can't approach this from the idea of what does this book say about the order in which things were created, because that's not a taxonomic question. That's a question that might be an interesting discussion, but it's not the question, it's not the discussion we're having now. This is a taxonomy discussion. So you also showed various things that weren't birds and points out that they weren't birds, like Tyrannosaurus rex, Pachycephalosaurus, uh, Parasaurolophus, but again, no one is claiming that these things are birds. The question is, are they dinosaurs? Why are they dinosaurs? And do birds fit the same definition that made them dinosaurs? And the answer is yes, of course. Because as I went through nearly every synapomorphy of dinosauria, which, are, which is to say all of the things that dinosaurs share and that make them dinosaurs are present in birds. So I don't know what the point was. And again, of course, we saw the Rausukian, which was not a dinosaur, but was claimed to be one. We saw a Komodo dragon with a question as to saying, maybe we're going back to reptiles, even though dinosaurs we never left them i already addressed the archaeopteryx real quick um you said the over raptor was looking a bit more mammal like i don't even know what that means there's uh, over raptor is no more like a mammal than a crocodile is i mean it's got feathers not fur uh it's got it's a di clearly a diapsid skull it's got the head or uh, sorry homeodont dentition it's got polyphodont dentition uh it doesn't have it has the articular quadrate uh, jaw joint, not the uh, dentary squamosal jaw joint. It has dorsal vertebrae as opposed to distinguished thoracic and lumbar. It's just hard for me to imagine someone taking, uh, coming to this argument with this uh, lack of prior research into taxonomy. And I'm not saying that Nicholas is, you know, not, not a smart guy here, but I am saying that this seems like someone who didn't actually prepare for the debate because the debate is about taxonomy and the presentation I was given in the opening showed a distinct lack of knowledge about taxonomy in the first place, which concerns me because I would like um, for creationists and uh, just people in general to have really good arguments because it's honestly, it's, it's more entertaining and more fun for me. And I have to think harder when there are good solid arguments. Instead, we're told that the platypus might not be identified as a mammal, at, even though it obviously would be by anyone who looked at it. And we're given confusion over what, a dinosaur is or what a reptile is. So I I really think that there, this was a somewhat lacking opening statement. And I suppose this rebuttal is now a bit more combative than I originally intended, but that's what it is. And with six seconds left, I'm going to yield the rest of my time. So what I wanna say right now is I wanna read out a quick super chat that we got. Uh, if it is a question, we will end up holding the answer. Um, one for Null says, I'm agreeing more with Dapper in parentheses. I'm a Christian, thank you very much for one for Null. That was for $2. Uh, everyone, make sure you do hit like. I'm seeing about 92 people watching, but only 55 likes. So please do. It helps the channel. And anyway, uh, this is the open discussion time. So we have this set aside. We're probably going to do this for about 40, 45 minutes or so. And then we will open it up to uh, audience Q&A. If we don't get enough questions, we'll just continue, you know, talking about whatever. But uh, Nicholas, please go ahead and uh, yeah, say whatever you want to. Well, I mean... Please don't. I, you know, I trust you not to be full of girl on my channel. <laughs> yeah, you can trust me with that one. So, um, yeah, I appreciate your um, direct rebuttal. And, um, yeah, as far yeah. as my awareness of taxonomy relative to skeletons, that was definitely lacking. Um, I guess my uh, my approach to discussing whether dinosaurs are birds or not is really questioning the validity of considering these similar traits to be an appropriate way to categorize the animals. One animal which we can observe and see what they're like, and the other animal which 
we have the skeletons and we can deduce what they're like. Um, yeah, so being that they were created separately and we know that they were created already different because there's not time for them to have evolved from common ancestors if they're um, if once you have life perpetuating, you do have an evolution mechanism, then there's not enough time for it anyway okay. um, in a mere 6,000 years. So since they are made separately and they're made so distinctly, it's not appropriate to say that one is the other because there is such a distinction. Unless you can um, argue that there's not a distinction, I did catch how they, ca according to certain criteria, they categorize within the category. Um, but the distinction has been there since the beginning and is very blatant. Okay, so I'm. I'd like to ask uh, a couple questions. Um, are cows mammals? Yes. Were all mammals created as a single group that then diversified into all mammals under your understanding? Or were there different um, kinds of mammals created at, on whichever creation yeah, they, day? There were different kinds. Okay. Yes. Are whales mammals? Yes. Were whales made with the other ocean creatures or were they made with the land creatures according to your idea? They were made with the ocean creatures. Okay. So we already know that all of the discussion about which kinds of creatures were made on what day or whether or not they were descended from each other isn't actually relevant to the question of taxonomy because are cows mammals and are whales mammals, that's a taxonomic question. So it doesn't matter at all what the Bible has to say about when things were made, whether they were all related to each other or how much time we have. What we have instead is we have a definition for mammalia, which is not found in the Bible. Instead, it's found in the work of taxonomists. In fact, the first taxonomist, Carolus Linnaeus. Now, he did not come up with the idea for dinosaurs because we hadn't actually reliably described dinosaurs at that point. It wouldn't be for another hundred or so years that we would. Now, we know that male, that sorry, whales and cows are mammals because of the shared anatomical traits that they shared with all other mammals. We also know that birds are dinosaurs for the same reason. They share anatomical traits with all other dinosaurs, which are the traits that define dinosaur. Why is that a not a valid approach? Um, I think the skeletal traits are insufficient in these sorts of categorizations. Like um, an amphibian is categorized, you know, by its life cycle and its cold bloodedness and those very special amphibian things that make them not reptiles or fish, for example. But they're also and characterized. I don't. I don't... Oh, sorry, go ahead. And I don't think that um, the because the bones have to do with uh, mechanical function of the body. So what we have when we see the similarities in the bones is similarity of function. But I don't think it's enough to go on for the type of category we're discussing. We're discussing. Are you aware that reptiles can be distinguished from amphibians solely based on skeletal criteria? You don't actually need to given a skeleton, a reasonably skilled comparative anatomist with enough training and taxonomy can reliably distinguish amphibian from reptilian skeletons, reptilian from mammalian skeletons, all the way down. I mean, if you'd like to, we can even play the game of, hey, what's the skeleton? And I will reliably tell you with high accuracy what group it belongs to. It's really not a very difficult thing. And when you say that the skeletal differences aren't enough, they are enough for even with extant animals, even if you don't know what the animal actually is, for you to tell very specifically what group it belongs to. So why is it that even though we can use skeletons, just skeletons right now, to reliably distinguish taxa to a very high degree of certainty, down usually at least to the genus if you're a fairly skilled taxonomist, but that isn't okay once we go to the fossil record? Because the testing and observing in actual reality is more than just the skeletons. And then they can verify that these well, skeletal similarities um, fit in other categories also. Well, I'm not arguing but, that we don't know more about extant animals than we do about fossil animals. But you still are in a situation where 
we can do the exact same thing with modern animals. You don't have to have a live animal or any of the flesh beyond the bones to distinguish whether or not something is a bird or a canine or all, all of these different things, or a frog or a salamander or a Sicilian. In fact, I happen to but, know very clearly what Sicilian skulls look like and they're nightmare factories. They're very distinctive. But, I, I, do, I do have the answer to this because the categories are shaped based on what we do know and then the criteria um for instance um if a criteria if we know that not all mammals have it it gets thrown out of being a mammal criteria and so the thing is is that we don't have the testing of dinosaurs to actually know if they're the same thing as birds we know that they have skeletal structures to mechanically move similarly to birds um, that's all that I see we know. All right, so do you think it is impossible to use a skeleton to determine if, say, an animal is a mammal? Just the skeleton, that's all we have. It's an extinct animal, we have the skeleton. Do you think we could reliably determine that this is, in fact, a mammal? Um... You see, then reliable would be subjective. So I don't want to be um, either absolutely credulous or absolutely incredulous. But um, we do see that God makes really cool creatures. And so um, it is always possible that there's an exception. Okay, do you see this the so, skeleton here? Yeah, and then um, the skull looks like it has, um, a, to me, looking at it real quick, it looks like it has some herbivore mammal type features that I'm used to seeing um, okay. in teeth and jaws. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through real quickly why it is that a paleontologist says that this is most definitely a mammal, okay? And we're going to go from front of the animal to back. Okay, so we have, starting at the front, we have uh, heterodont dentition, so we've got incisors, canines, and molars. Now, going farther back, we've got a dentary squamosal jaw joint, with a, uh, which is completely unique to mammals. Farther back, we have a complete lack of cervical ribs. At the shoulder girdle, we have a lack of coracoids. We only have the scapula to attach the uh, shoulder girdle to the rest of the body. Then going farther back, we have a distinction between thoracic and lumbar vertebrae, with the lumbar vertebrae lacking uh, ribs. Going farther back, we have the distinct offset femoral head with a lack of any of those reptilian characteristics that I was talking about earlier. And, um, yeah, why is that not sufficient to identify a skeleton as a mammal, even though every known mammal has it? It's, the def it's included in the definition of mammal. It's how we tell if something is a mammal or not in science. We can tell. Similarly, we can do the same thing with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are defined as those animals that have these certain traits in terms of taxonomy. What is wrong with that definition? And what definition of dinosaur would you prefer? Okay, so the difference is that we have verifying specimen for mammals, but we do not have verifying specimen at all whatsoever for non-bird dinosaurs. Um, so without any verifying the specimen to totally know what we're verifying. We don't even know what is proper criteria for verification. So is your argument that we don't have holotypes for dinosauria? Um, I don't know what a holotype is exactly. Okay, well this gets back to my, my concern from earlier. It's if you want to have a discussion with, about taxonomy, you need to know the very basics of the field. A holotype is the initial specimen that defines a taxon based on its anatomy. It's how we determine what various taxa are. Now, we have dinosaurian taxa, and we have holotypes for them. Each genus has a holotype. And I also didn't get an answer to the question, what is the definition of dinosaur that you would like? Because unless you have a definition of dinosaur, then there's no point in saying whether or not birds are ones because you don't know what a dinosaur is. So what is your definition for dinosaur? Oh yeah, we have these skeletons of 
a rather wide spectrum of animals that have all gone extinct um, for some reason in a short time. And um, while it's a wide spectrum of animals, there's um, a lot of traits that they seem to categorize together and they're distinct from other categories. And so then um, those skeletons are grouped together as dinosaurs. So, you know, that would exclude um, pterosaurs by my understanding because they don't have that general same shape. Um, not pterosaurs, sorry, pteranodons. Um, well, I guess pterosaurs are a branch separate from dinosaur yet. Is that, um, that is how accurate. you're classifying it? That is accurate, okay. yes. So I always thought of it as the two branches of Dinosauria. So you mentioned um, archosaurs. So uh, the way I, I thought of it was basically archosaurs and um, the pteranodon side of Dinosauria. And then there's the ones that are like um, maybe more like Triceratops might be their own category. But um, Okay, but I'm waiting for, rather than examples, could you give a definition? So for instance... Let's say I come up to you with the remains of an animal. What would you look at to decide if the animal whose remains I have is a dinosaur or not a dinosaur? Okay. Um, I don't know the detailed traits, but I would not choose... Um, you see, I would include... Um, sauropods in the dinosaur category Why? because of the traits that sauropods and dinosauria share. Right, I would like you to name which, those. Um, well, I don't... Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I am coming at this from... A different angle with different justifications. So, so you don't have a list um, of traits that you could use to identify an animal as a dinosaur. You would simply base on the fact that people call these things dinosaurs. That's why you're calling them dinosaurs. Well, I don't know the list of the traits because I'm not an expert on that level. Now, um, as far as um, details, now when I showed examples, it was very obvious which ones were birds and which ones were dinosaurs, including the sauropods being very similar okay. um, to the dinosaurs. Now, where there is dissimilarity, were things directly related to mechanics, which is where the birds and the archosaurs were so similar, um, is based on the mechanics, but we expect that when the design is for them to function the same. But when we see the similarities that seem to reflect similarity of body type, then um, in a category such as like reptile, bird, mammal, or amphibian. So when we see they seem to have the same sort of makeup, more likely in the ways that categorize in that respect, then um, dinosaurs then make for their own category in that respect. Okay, so which oh, sorry, may or may not include which may or may not include birds, because um, it is possible that when we find out more about dinosaurs, that even though there's such a clear distinction between looking at a dinosaur and a bird, that they do have the same sort of um, blood type, flesh type, bone type sort of makeup that is how one of these categories is defined. But okay. then they may not have those similarities. All right, so uh, one of your main points was it was very easy to tell when something was a bird or not. But you also brought up sauropods. It's also very easy to tell if something is a sauropod or not, right? Like you're never going to mix up a T-Rex with a sauropod like Brontosaurus. Yet you included sauropods within Dinosauria. So what I'm getting, oh, did you want to be shown? Oh, no, you didn't. Sorry. So what I'm getting from you is because I can tell when it's a bird or not, therefore it's not a dinosaur, but you do not apply that, that uh, criterion consistently to other dinosaurs. Every group of dinosaurs is easy to figure out whether or not something is in it, with a very 
occasional exceptions of extremely basal members of the group, like Herrerasaurus or uh, maybe Skeletosaurus or some Herodontosaurus, right? Generally speaking, the major groups of dinosaurs that everyone knows, you know, the, the Hadrosaurs, the Ceratopsians, the Tyrannosaurids, um, the Sauropods, these are all easy to distinguish from other dinosaurs. Being easy to distinguish doesn't make you not a dinosaur. Similarly, we know what whales are. You never confuse a whale for anything else. They're completely unlike any other mammals. They're off-the-wall bonkers in terms of mammal diversity, but that doesn't make them not mammals. And you still have not actually been able to provide a definition for dinosauria, which concerns me because you came to a debate call that had the formula, is X a member of group Y? In order to determine whether group X is a subset of group Y, you need to be able to define both X and Y. I'm not, yeah. you, you've demonstrated that you cannot provide a, de a definition for dinosauria, so you are already incapable of answering the question at well, all. Well, I, I, I said that the best way to define it is based on the bones that can categorize as in the same category from our observational and testable perspective. So what we're able to test and observe about them, we can categorize them into one category and then it's appropriate to name that and i don't have a better definition because all we have are bones but we're talking about something that is well beyond bones um such as you know um mammals are defined um maybe one of the more straightforward definitions that works really well is the milk producing one i'm not sure exactly um if that one has any kinks in it or not but that's an example of something that is um, not very skeletal. And there's just so much that goes into this level of categorization that is not skeletal that it's inappropriate to pretend a definition more than what we have. So I'm saying is that these categorize with their um, evidential similarity, but I'm not, um, yeah, I didn't go into what I would see as irrelevant correlations um, that we don't have time for the causation that's proposed, nor um, without a creator God, the evolutionary uh, model has no potential beginning because we know enough about chemistry to rule a biogenesis out. And so um, I think that's one big hiccup we're having here is that I am very much operating on the valid model which is what God told us in his word, um, as opposed to the invalid model, which I know you're operating from, the evolutionary model. All right, well, a few things. One is, um, this isn't a discussion about abiogenesis. If you want to have one of those, that would be another thing to set up. This isn't a debate about the age of the earth. If you want to have the, one of those, that would be another discussion to set up. Um, further, let's, let's be clear with everyone here. The difference between believing in the flat earth and a young earth is just how long we've known that you're wrong. That's the only real difference. There is no actual option for the young earth, but we're not here to talk about it. So I'm not sure why it's being brought up. But also you contradicted yourself in your attempt to clarify your idea behind what a definition for dinosaur would be. Because first you said that we should look at the various criteria that we can use to group together things in the bones. And then you later said that because for other dinosaurs we have things other than bones, we can't use that. But again, even if that weren't a contradiction, it's still wrong to say that for non-avian dinosaurs, all we have is bones. We have feathers, we have muscle attachment points, in some cases we even have fossilized muscles and tendons. We have uh, scarring from air sacs, we, ha we know of uh, air sac invagination points in the bones. We even know that histologically, birds and dinosaurs are almost exact, well, birds are dinosaurs, but we know that especially theropod dinosaurs had extremely bird-like histology. For instance, we know that at least uh, Silurosaur dinosaurs laid down medullary bone when they were preparing to mate, which is something that birds do in order to have a calcium reserve to make hard eggshells. All of this is more indication that birds are dinosaurs, and you're saying that we can't classify them because we know too much about birds as dinosaurs. It doesn't follow. All, all that knowing having more of the animal than the skeleton does is give you more information about the animal. But if, as you said earlier, the definition of dinosaurs can be 
at least based on skeletal features, which by the way, you still haven't bothered to define, which means again, you are incapable of answering the question in any meaningful way because you don't have a definition for dinosaur. We can still classify birds as dinosaurs under at least your first version of how we might define dinosaurs. Um, well, that's what's inappropriate about it is that there's no evidence that um, birds and dinosaurs have those have full similarity of being the same type, the way that all reptiles have similarities that they do not have with mammals. All mammals have similarities they do not have with birds. Do you know any we of those? Not, we, do not, we do not have any observation or testing regarding birds having all those similarities with dinosaurs. Do, um, do you have any examples? We do see, and we see enough of a distinction between birds and dinosaurs in their skeletons that it is easily possible that there's some major distinction there. And I think one thing we have to look at is the fact that there are no dinosaurs left now. Well, except that there now, are um, there are tens of thousands of species of dinosaur. You can't assume your own conclusion as part of your argument. Well, speaking from just my perspective in order to get it out of my mouth and say it, but um, now I do agree that I don't prove my case just by saying my case, but um, I was segueing into um, what I was going to present. Oh, that there are no dinosaurs left now. Now, um, we know that before the flood, there was far more oxygen. And in your timeline, that's not before the flood, but there is um, a distinct ancient past which had far more oxygen where certain kinds of animals were far larger because of that, that sort of thing. And so um, there definitely seems to be some direct correlation between um, the flood, the drop off of oxygen level, and then um, non-bird dinosaurs, <laughs> but dinosaurs becoming very rare, and yet um, birds have thrived. And so that also indicates to me, based on what we do know, that um, there seems that maybe there is an important distinction, which is why the one type is wiped out and the other one were not. So that's further evidence that though there's similarities of skeletons, um, we're not able to test and verify that it's appropriate to define them in the same category um, on the level of like reptiles as opposed to amphibians, as opposed to mammals, that level of categorization as opposed to fish. Okay, well, there are a few things there. Um... In fact, the high oxygen was prominent during what in most of the world is called the uh, Carboniferous, but which we like to break up and to do separate periods in the United States, sorry, not the United States, but in North America, because, well, North American geologists are kind of jerks, or at least they were at that point. It was very annoying. But anyway, this is long before the appearance of the first dinosaurs. So this extra oxygen argument is, at least in terms of uh, explaining the extinction for dinosaurs, does, doesn't work. But the fact is that the there being a small remnant of a larger, more diverse group in the past doesn't negate its being part of that group. For example, uh, proboscideans were once much, much, much more diverse. Now we have three species, two species in genus Loxodonta and one species in Elephus, Elephus maximus, the, the Asian elephant. Um, but the fact that those things are the only ones left, that we only have members of Elephantidae and only two genera, doesn't negate that Platybelodon or Gompotheres or any of the other proboscideans were proboscideans, and that modern elephants are also proboscideans. In fact, we know that they're proboscideans. In fact, even AIG identifies them all as proboscideans, lumping them all into a single kind. So pointing out that the only candidates that we have for dinosauria are a small group of what diversity once existed for the group isn't helpful at all. And whether or not there was a flood doesn't change any of that because we know that things have gone extinct past the point where you think there was a flood, right? If you think there was a flood about 4,400 years ago, which feel free to contest that dating, I'm just giving it out as a number because it's a common one. We know that things have gone extinct before that time. And if an entire family goes extinct, that doesn't mean that other members, or even if all members of an order, except for one family go extinct, that doesn't make the order not exist. And it doesn't make that member not a part, that family not a part of the order. So this is just a complete non sequitur, but again, we still don't have the ability 
for you to distinguish dinosaurs from non-dinosaurs. So until we get there, I don't understand what you're arguing. Because you cannot possibly have a reason birds are not dinosaurs unless you know what a dinosaur is in the first place. So for instance, when you said that whales were mammals, that's because you have a reasonable idea of what it takes to be a mammal. You do not have that for dinosaur. Therefore, you are completely incapable by your own admission of identifying a dinosaur as such, except by reference to experts, which you will accept for the bird, for the, sorry, for the animals that aren't birds, but are dinosaurs. But for some reason, you will not accept it for birds, even though you yourself are not expert in this and admittedly do not know the definition. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not proposing um, a definition based on specific traits that I am aware of. Now, um, if, you there need to. Is, if, if there is no distinct wide gap, then I'm not sure that um, I don't think we would make a separation on the level that we're discussing here. But um, I showed birds and dinosaurs, and there was a wide gap. And so without anything to test to close that gap, um, it's not appropriate to assume that the gap closes. Now, what we were saying about promycidians, um, we do have some of those to test at least some of them. Like if we had some dinosaurs left to test, um, you know, non-avian dinosaurs left to test. But that's like asking for non-elephant proboscideans to test in order to determine that elephants are proboscideans. You're having a double standard here. You don't well, get to say I... that birds aren't dinosaurs, therefore we don't have dinosaurs to test if birds are dinosaurs. That is well, assuming I, I have... the consequence. I have not looked at promycidians um, that, you know, were extinct. Is there a group that you have that we could look Surely. at? But, well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that if the promycidians are clearly promycidians, like there are extinct birds, like the terror bird, mm -hmm. but it is clearly a bird when you look at it. So it's not right. inappropriate to um, think it's probably a bird. Now, I'm open to there being some kind of exception where it had super similar bird bones, but was a unique creature. But um that doesn't really fit the pattern that we see. It would but certainly see, be a big problem for evolution. An... What? It would certainly be a big problem for evolution if you could find something that was a chimera like that. It was almost, it had a lot of <laughs> bird features, but then it had like a weird mammal trait. That would probably go a long way towards falsifying evolution. So you should hope for that because there's no reason God couldn't make it, but there are really good reasons evolution couldn't. Oh, well, Jesus has already made God obvious. And so we can trust God's word. And so. Well, I'm not here to argue um, against know, the existence we, of God, so. Yeah, yeah, that, I'm not arguing about that, but I'm just saying, like, um, we're, I'm not looking for there to be a problem for evolution because God has already um, sealed his assurance of his reputation of it with his son, Jesus Christ. So, okay, so the, the problem, again, is you're continuing to have a double standard because we do have extinct elephants, right? We, in fact, have extinct members, even of genus Loxodonta, but also... Members of genus Mammoth, or Mammothus, sorry, which is the Mammoths, in fact, are more closely related to genus Elephus, the Asian elephant, Elephus Maximus, than they are to genus Loxodonta, the African elephants. So we also have extinct elephantids, just like we have extinct birds, but again, we can still tell that they're proboscideans because we know what a proboscidean is. And still, we can tell what birds are because we know what a dinosaur is. But the problem remains, you don't know oh. that. Well, that's where we disagree, I guess, is that I'm saying that, um, like, you have a dinosaur on the screen right there, but, like... I do. We've seen the skeletons, and we've seen some further samples. So, um, on a surface level of what it looks like, um, we're limited to how much we know if that's really um, what a dinosaur looked like. But um, when it comes to what it is, I um, mean, it's flesh makeup and... Um, life process traits, you know, like uh, I say life process traits like amphibians or, or um, having milk, you know, reproductive type of traits. like. Well, we know, we know that many, we know all dinosaurs laid eggs. We know that at least theropods laid calcium 
uh, hardened eggshells that were essentially chemically identical to bird eggs because we can actually tell, we can actually go in and look at the calcium. Uh, we know that bird, that most uh, theropods, especially Salurosaurs, and even more especially Manoraptorans, the groups that are getting closer and closer to birds, were in fact warm-blooded. We also know that they did things like lay down medullary bone when they were preparing to mate or while during the early stages of being gravid, just like birds. I mean, we know that in fact many of these things that you would like to talk about, like warm-bloodedness or cold-bloodedness, life cycle, did they have external or internal fertilization, these things, we know how it worked in many cases for dinosaurs. And it's the same way that it works for birds, especially in those dinosaurs most closely associated with birds taxonomically. So we know all of these things. The fact that you think all we have is a collection of bones simply displays your ignorance of the field of paleontology. Yeah, and I, I do respect that there is more known um, than what I know, obviously. And um, the hard shell eggs, and you say that they found that they are calcium but um it still sounds like you jumped to knowing some details where um maybe um some of it there's an assumption that the dinosaurs are similar to birds is the only way we know and that's what i mean when i say that it's um untested no there isn't an and, assumption that uh, birds are related to dinosaurs there's a conclusion based on the hypothesis that they might be because way back in the 19th century, people noticed that bird legs looked a whole lot like dinosaur legs. But for the most part, that was kind of forgotten about. Then later, in the middle of the 20th century, in about the 60s and 70s, we started finding more and more Manoraptoran dinosaurs that looked more and more like birds. And so then there were hypotheses made up. And since then, the various things that I've told you aren't things that we assumed based on the connection to birds. They are things which we have found subsequent, which do two things. One reinforce the bird dinosaur connection and two make us reassess dinosaurs as being more bird-like rather than reassessing birds as being more dinosaur-like what has actually happened throughout the history of the last 30 or so years in paleontology is not birds moving closer to dinosaurs but non-bird dinosaurs moving closer to birds because of new discoveries you have the causality exactly backwards because again you don't know the field in which you've come to argue about Okay, and then, um, so I guess um, the simplified version of the disagreement is that um, I'm saying we don't know if birds are dinosaurs because we don't know what dinosaurs are on that level. Now, um, I am hearing everything you're presenting. I'm not sure um, which of those things are deductive conclusions and All which are... Um, tested observations. All of, they're all first deducted based on observations and then tested and found to be accurate. That's how science works. That's why we teach these things in science classrooms. Because first we said, hey, gee, I wonder if dinosaurs have medullary bones. Then someone sawed open a Tyrannosaurus uh, femur and said, oh, gee, this is morphologically identical to medullary bone. Then they checked and even under a microscope, it remained morphologically identical to medullary bone. So you say, well, hey, if it looks like a duck and it smells like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it must be a duck. Dinosaurs had medullary bone. You look at the histo histological patterns and you say, okay, did dinosaurs have a high metabolism or a low metabolism? You can tell by looking at the bones of modern animals how fast animals grew and how fast they grow is constrained by metabolism. So we know they had this much or higher metabolism because that's, a, again, metabolism is a constraint on animal growth. So you check the histological patterns in dinosaur long bones, and you find out that many of them, especially the ones closer to birds, had a very high metabolism. You look at, say, okay, gee, I wonder how dinosaurs breathe, because, you know, the initial description of, say, Sinoceropteryx included the supposition of maybe a hepatic piston, like a crocodile. But then later redescription by the same authors said, nope, sorry, and we find later scarring in various bones, as well as inv obvious invagination of air sacs in long bones in dinosaurs, that match up with the air sac system in birds. And you say, well, I guess dinosaurs had a avian style respiratory system. You say, gee, I wonder what the integument was like of these various dinosaurs. And you start to hypothesize based on the integument you've already found. And then you look for signs like quill knobs or actual feather impressions or scale impressions. And then when you find them, you check them against your previous predictions based on phylogenetic bracketing. And what we find time and time again is that our predictions based on the idea that birds are a subset of dinosaurs come true when we test those predictions against the actual fossil evidence. 
But instead, you would like to stand here and say on the basis of your ignorance of what a dinosaur is, that because we don't know as much about extinct dinosaurs as we do about birds, that you should be hesitant about calling birds dinosaurs, even though we know enough about dinosaurs to know what they are, and we know enough about them to know that birds meet all of those criteria. So either we can't know whether anything is a dinosaur, including birds, or birds are dinosaurs. Those are the only options that are logically open to us. Okay, the, um, the two options again, one was that either birds are dinosaurs or we can't know if anything is a dinosaur. Anything at all. You can't yeah, tell if, if we... sauropods are dinosaurs. You can't tell if stegosaurus is a dinosaur. You can't tell if T-Rex is a dinosaur. Because if all of those are dinosaurs, the reasons that make all of them dinosaurs also apply to birds. So either dinosaur doesn't mean anything, or birds are in the group. Yeah, and I just disagree. I was able to um, show that bird dinosaurs, sorry, bird skeletons are very distinct from the skeletons of any other dinosaurs. Right, and as are the skeletons from... of orn ornithomimids. They're very distinct from other dinosaurs. The skeletons of uh, sauropods are very distinct from other dinosaurs. That is not a distinguishing criterion. Being able to say, hey, this is a member of group X doesn't mean it's not a member of larger group Y. I can tell what an ape skeleton is. I can tell what an elephant skeleton is. I can tell what a whale skeleton is. My ability to easily distinguish these groups does not make them non-mammals. The ability to easily distinguish birds doesn't make them not dinosaurs. That is a non sequitur. Please stop using it. I've already had to correct you on this probably four or five times. It is not a valid argument. Your ability to easily identify birds means nothing in terms of whether or not birds are members of a larger group. Well, what it means is that the distinction in order to have a definition of dinosaurs, which includes all dinosaurs, but does not include birds, is a very straightforward distinction, is my point. Because then why you're saying you that it? unless you, you're saying that unless birds are included in dinosaurs, dinosaurs can have no definition. But I actually nope, showed clearly that, that you backwards. can look at all these different skeletons and you can see that there is a category that they can be put into together, which clearly excludes birds. And not only that, but that category also has in common our perspective towards it. Like if we had even one dinosaur remaining, to verify what those dinosaurs were, then we would have a lot more to work with. We could compare that dinosaur to birds, but we don't have that to work with. But um, yeah, what you're saying about if you don't have birds excluded, then there's no way for dinosaurs to have a definition. That's just not true. You can. That's not what I said. I said it's the exact look... opposite. I said, because we have a definition for dinosaurs and birds fall into it, there are only op two options. Either we accept that birds are dinosaurs or we reject the definition, in which case we don't know what a dinosaur oh. is. That, that's, well, that's I would backwards. say that we need to include the lack of testing um, when the lack of testing and observation of actual flesh corpses or flesh living animals. Um, that lack of observation is an important part of the definition because we don't even have a single sample to go on in order to inform that. We have literally zero samples to go on to inform that. So that lack of knowing is an important part of the definition. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a quick response, and then we're going to go back to Nicholas, and then we're going to open and Nicholas this sort of a closing section. We're going to have a few minutes to do some closing, and then we're going to go into um, Q&A. We do already have two super chatted questions. Uh, if you did ask a question earlier, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat it because, uh, sorry, but I'm probably not going to try to scroll all the way up to find your question since, you know, 20 comments ago. Um, so... My final say is that in this entire time, I was expecting, at least, to come up with someone who had a working definition for what a dinosaur is, because this is just a logical requirement of the discussion. If you want to say whether or not the Bible is a book, you need to be able to say what a book is. You need to be able to distinguish books from other objects. If you can't, then on no basis at all can you just tell whether or not the Bible is a book. Similarly, if you don't know what a dinosaur is, then you can't tell if a brontosaurus is a dinosaur or if a bird is. Instead, what we got was someone relying on the expertise of actual scientists to determine whether or not brontosaurus and stegosaurus and triceratops and T-Rex were dinosaurs, 
but who then for some reason decides to reject it when those same experts confirm that yes in fact birds are dinosaurs and all of the rambling about whether or not we have sufficient uh data from soft tissue for dinosaurs or all of the mistakes about whether or not this or that is a dinosaur and being unable, unable to tell exactly where pterosaurs fit or whether pteranodons are pterosaurs or not knowing that you can skeletally distinguish amphibians from other groups of uh, tetrapods. None of that is supportive of the actual claim that birds aren't dinosaurs. What would be is defining dinosaur in a way that actually fits with how dinosaur is defined and then showing that birds do not fit that definition. That's not what we got. But that's my last piece in the open discussion. And uh, Nicholas, if you could give, uh, you know, two to three minutes of closing, and then we will go into Q&A, and I will describe how we're going to run that when we get there. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, well, I do think we did a good job of um, expressing what our differences are in how we um, see these categorizations so that really that's the one thing we just don't know if that visually obvious leap between a dinosaur like bird and a bird like dinosaur if um if the flesh behind that visually obvious leap in the skeletons if that leap and how they are flesh-wise would put them in different categories, the same way that um, birds and reptiles are in different categories and reptiles and fish and fish and amphibians and amphibians and mammals. Now, dinosaurs, it is possible that birds could subcategorize within that category or not. We just don't know. We do know that they were created in the same day um, with a lot of variety already. And all the birds already existed with their similarities to each other. And then there's a noticeable gap. And then there's a spectrum of dinosaurs, which to me implies that they're a whole different um, sort of animal, not just a unique kind only, but a unique category of animal um, seems to be the case and is probably also why they went extinct. Is that it? That'll be it, yes. Okay, awesome. So uh, what we are gonna do now is we are gonna go into a Q&A section. And so um, I have a suspicion most of them are gonna be for Nicholas, but that might not end up being the case. We might get a few for me. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but in debates, it, it tends to be that the person who's opposing the side of the channel owner ends up being the one who gets all the questions. Um, that's just how these things go, right? So, you know, of course, most of my audience is going to be on my side because that's why they watch me. So, uh, but anyway, what my plan is right now is I'm going to first prioritize um, uh, Super Chat. Sorry, I couldn't think of the word. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through them and I will give a three minute timer to Nicholas to answer questions. Then I will give myself a two minute timer to give any response. And then Nicholas will get a final word on any questions for him. And if the questions for me, it'll be reversed. And then we'll move on. Um, if you want to have your question answered, please tag me. Now I don't have someone collecting the questions, so you might have to say it a few times in order for me to get to it. Unless of course uh, it is a super chat, which is automatically collected by YouTube. They make that easy for me. So um, we're gonna start off with the super chat questions. So this is for $5 from House of Reason 78, uh, who says, why do facts not matter other than you have a presupposition that does not agree? And I believe that is probably for you. So you have up to three minutes to go ahead and respond. How did he say why facts not matter? Uh, it says, why do facts not matter other than you have a presupposition? That, why do facts not matter other than, be, than because you have a presupposition that does not agree? Yeah. Um... It's not that the facts don't matter. In fact, um, I did take notes on the similarities that Dapper Dino listed. And I'm not um, trying to argue that Dapper Dino did not make a good case. But um, knowing that 
they're created at the same time and there seems to be um a very noticeable you can just see with your naked eye the distinction between the two categories even though some of the dinosaurs right are very similar to birds mechanically and in size and proportion and stuff and some of the birds are very similar to the dinosaurs yet even though they're similar and they're from the same time there's still a distinct gap and so um the way we look at the facts is definitely very different but i'm not saying that the facts are just not relevant is that it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I don't actually know if I can really answer that question, but I will say that um, I do think that Nicholas thinks that facts are relevant, but I don't think he's willing to actually investigate the facts because uh, this debate has been uh, set up for, I believe, a bit over a week now. And during that time, I don't see any evidence that he actually went out and looked into the topic at hand, which is to say dinosaur attack and bird taxonomy so i yeah and uh you have up to a minute to respond to that if you want and then we'll move on to the next question oh yeah um what i did was um i kept it mostly at the skeleton level and um brought up the comparisons that way like i showed but i didn't um prepare beyond just how i was um my perspective that I already had. So I came here to represent the perspective that I have and not to like um, scientifically prepare and come with a more scientific perspective than mine. So I am sorry if that's like a total disappointment or something. I did try to sort of um, dapper mention that I would approach it differently than other people do and stuff. This is sort of what I meant by that. All right. So our next question is another super chat, which comes from Ray Cosby for five US dollars, who says, how does Nicholas know a Tyrannosaurus and a Brachiosaurus are both dinosaurs rather than two unrelated creatures? Oh, yeah, I don't know. That's what I mean by the lack of um, direct observation and direct testing on a certain level is part of the definition because um, you actually could take Dinosauria and Brontosauria and separate them out. Um, that would depend on, like, you know, the flesh type of features that we have so little information on. But um, there does seem to be a similarity there, but they might be different categories, too. So I agree in that sense. Okay. Well, all I really have to say is I, I don't think that he does know it uh, for the same reason that he doesn't know whether or not birds are dinosaurs, because... Nicholas doesn't know what dinosaurs are, and so he can't reliably put anything into dinosaur except by relying on experts, which is fine. Not everyone has to know everything, right? There's no reason that everyone needs to be an expert in everything. But if you don't know what you're talking about, and instead you're going to take the word of experts, you should do it consistently, in which case Nicholas should conclude that birds are dinosaurs simply because uh, that's the overwhelming scientific consensus from the people who know what they're talking about. And uh, Nicholas, you have up to a minute to respond to my response, if you'd like. Okay, and I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, this next one comes from Tyler West for 499 US, who says, Nicholas, in what way does it threaten your faith if birds fall into the category of dinosaurs? Um, it does not threaten my faith at all. In fact, I started looking at this stuff and I was thinking like... Um, Dinosaurs are not birds. And then I looked at the wording. I'm like, no, birds are not dinosaurs. And I was like, well, birds might be dinosaurs. It's possible. And so um, I was like, um, so I, that was when I looked up all the um, bird skeletons and I was comparing the birds that were most similar to non bird dinosaurs and comparing the dinosaurs to the birds. And I was like, well, they were made at the same time. And there is a very distinct gap here. So, um, I can offer why I would propose that we don't know they're the same thing because, um, yeah, as far as those flesh characteristics, I still don't know that. Um, even though Dapper did list um, some good evidences that seem to coincide the two, um, especially the porous 
sort of bones and flesh as part of the respiratory system. Um, so I took notice of that, but I also think that um, maybe if dinosaurs, maybe their respiratory system was somewhat unique from birds, which could contribute to the lack of oxygen after the flood being the same time when they seem to have gone extinct. So for me, that evidence sort of goes both ways, but I was listening to um, the points Dapper Dino made. They're good points. Okay, um, one second. So I actually, I'm going to take this, the stance of, I don't think it really should affect uh, the faith of any Christians, whether or not uh, birds happen to fall into a particular taxonomic category. Um, I'm not someone who thinks that uh, either taxonomy or evolution is incompatible with Christianity. Most Christians aren't anti-evolutionists. Um, I, in fact, actually, even young Earth creationism isn't actually threatened simply by the taxonomic placement of birds within dinosauria. So it's it's kind of a weird th place that a lot of uh, young Earth creationists have hung their hat. I don't know why they've done it, but they have, and I think it's a really poor tactical choice. But hey, I'm not here to coach young Earth creationists, I guess. Uh, and, of course, uh, Nick, if you want, you have up to a minute to respond to my, to me. Yeah, for me, it's definitely not a tactical choice. I just threw out in side chat that birds are not dinosaurs. And then Dapper Dino was like, well, we could talk about that. So I took him up on it. And um, like I said, I did prepare to um, express the perspective I was coming with, but I did not prepare to address it from a more detailed um, criteria. Is that it? Yeah, so okay. it's just, um, I, I can agree with you that this is not a tactic to like argue young Earth from this specific debate. Um, okay. I'm just willing to um, honestly give the best case um, and have the discussion. Okay. Now, I do want to repeat that um, I'm not currently able to reliably capture questions that aren't uh, super chatted in. So when I get through the super chats, which I think we only have three more, um, please repeat questions that I might not have answered. Um, normally, I would find that to be kind of spammy, but I currently am having trouble actually uh, archiving them. So, um, sorry. Uh, I basically, I don't have quite the support staff and setup that I would like to have lots of debates with lots of Q and A's. So um, yeah. And also do remember to tag me in them so that I, they catch my eye when I can finish with the super chats. So uh, this next uh, super chat is for $10 redos from Virilian. How does Nicholas know how to separate categories by what educational, uh, sorry, what educational study has he attended sources other than the Bible? Oh yeah. Well, um, I went through school, and I did have a very good biology teacher, but we did more, um, this was in high school, um, perhaps my final year of high school, and we did more chemistry and biochemistry and chemical evolution, and then um, a little bit of evolutionism in there. But um, I'm also just in the information age, I've tended to look up different sorts of animals at times and think about um, how they seem similar and different and stuff. I used to find evolution very um, fascinating. It actually, it is a very fascinating um, way to look at um, all the data. But, um, so I have definitely um, thought about evolution a lot. And then when I became a Christian, I was still open to evolutionism. But ultimately, um, I didn't find science that convinced me of evolutionism. And then I started finding that science goes well with a younger Earth. And so the difference between evolutionism or young Earth, for me, I was drawn scientifically to young Earth. Um, perhaps there's definitely a bias at play there with the Bible, but it's just kind of hard to say because like Dapper Dino says, if someone has faith in Jesus, even if they're convinced that um, 
creation was done over a long period of time with an evolutionary process that's still not going to threaten their faith in Jesus. Um, I wouldn't think so anyway. All right. Well, since that was basically a, bio, a biographical question, I don't really have any response because I can't talk to your, you know, your life. I wasn't there. So we're just going to move on to the next question, and I, I won't respond to that one. Does that work for you, Nick? I'm sorry. Can I call you, Nick? Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, that's okay, yeah. Okay. Some, you know, I, I want to make sure that I call people what they want to be called. Um, so our next one from Eric the Tyrannoceratops for four ninety nine US says, oh, what are, oh, wait, no, I'm no, that is the next one. Uh, what are Nick's thoughts on igneous rocks such as granite disproving the flood? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't know flood geology details um, very well. So I can't best answer that. I have um, observed a lot of lectures on the topic, but I haven't gone through them in a reviewed kind of way to have data memorized. So I don't know what you're referring to as disproving the flood. Now, I understand there are large sheets of soil on the earth that seem to have been laid down at once. And, um, Well, I'll just leave it at that, at my most general understanding of it, because, yeah, I'm not scientifically prepared to right. be responsible with that. So granites are a form of igneous intrusion that comes up from under the surface into overlying uh, strata of rocks. And one of the interesting things about that is that we know the difference between uh, igneous intrusions into unlithified and aqueous rocks and into already lithified rock, because... In unlithified aqueous rocks, you actually get to see things like, uh, you get to see the remains of things like bubbles forming and collapsing. So essentially, it's similar to cavitation. It's not actually cavitation, because cavitation is about pressure, not temperature. But it's a similar kind of phenomenon. And so all over the world, in, well, not all over the world, but in many places, you can actually see places where there's igneous intrusion into unlithified sediment, which has then later lithified. And you can also see granitic intrusions into areas where the rock was already lithified. Now, the fact that you can find these uh, igneous intrusions into already lithified rock means that the rock had to lithify. But we know chemically and mechanically how long it takes various kinds of rocks to lithify. And we know that after the flood, not all of the flood layers could possibly have been lithified because of what they're made of. We also happen to know that mo most of them couldn't have even been laid down by a flood in the first place. But even if we ignore that problem, you still know that they couldn't have been lithified. And so igneous intrusions into them that do not show signs of the overlying strata of having already been lithified, or sorry, do not, that do not show signs of the over, signs of the overlying strata having been unlithified, disproves the idea that these strata were laid down in a flood. Of course, it's one of a, a near infinite number of things that can disprove the flood. I mean, essentially, if you want to disprove the flood, you're, you can write books for your entire life on reasons that we know the flood absolutely 100% did not happen. And uh, Nicholas, if you want, you can have one minute to respond to that. Yeah, so this, I think, is where we um, get into problems of having such an entirely different model that um, all of the data that we find when it comes to how we model the past, whichever way we model it, we fit everything into our own model. So within our own model, it always seems very, very strong. Um, that said, it would have to be its whole own debate, and I would not um, be prepared to do that debate, even on a casual level like I did this one. Okay. Now we have for $5 from Jake4D. Nicholas, in your opinion, and I, he said... Kakapo, but I think he means Kakapo because that is a bird, whereas Kakapo isn't. Uh, so do the Kakapo, Dodo, Weka, Common Kiwi, Takahe, Emu, Ostrich, Penguin, Galapagos Cormorant, or Fagwin Steamer Duck count as birds? Um, as far as I know, all of those are birds. I don't know if I knew what every single one of those listed was. But um, yeah, and... We tend to categorize birds um, by feathers, being that um, I don't think we have any non-bird feathered animals right now. But um, 
So that tends to be a very clean way to define them, like what I learned, you know, growing up. But at the same time, like we wouldn't define, you know, uh, mammals based specifically on hair when I don't know exactly what the differences between mammal and insect hair are, but insects do have fur, for instance, or um, scales or something that um, fish and reptiles have, even though they may have different types of scales. And um, I don't know, um, we I did hear Dapper address the similarities between dinosaur feathers from the evidence we do have, and then the bird feathers, which we have. So um, I would say that, yes, those are all birds and um even though what we would use to categorize birds may be something that dinosaurs have in common which is feathers that um i think dapper and i would both agree that dinosaurs are not birds but birds might be dinosaurs so that kind of um sums up how i don't think that dinosaurs having feathers proves that they're necessarily the same thing. There could be two different types of things with feathers. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I'm not entirely sure where to start because I, I think we just had all filamentous entanglement conflated with mammal fur and uh, the point that because some insects have filaments, they're similar to mammals. I, I, I'll just say this. I think that statement further illustrates the woeful inadequacy of Nicholas's preparation for this. And I think most of my audience does not need to explain to them how easy it is to distinguish mammals from insects, which aren't even chordates. Um, yeah, they're not even deuterostomes. Uh, so within bilateria, you basically can't get any farther away from a mammal than an insect. Um, I know technically there's like AC limits, but whatever. I know flatworms exist. Thanks, guys. But yeah, um, I don't have anything to say other than essentially what I just said and to point that like this is the, the argumentation that we're given. So uh, if you would like, uh, Nicholas, you can have another minute. Oh, yeah. My, my point was just that though dinosaurs and birds um, both have feathers, at least some dinosaurs definitely seem to have feathers. But there could be two different types of things that both have feathers, but because of other very relevant characteristics that we're not able to directly test, they could still be different things. And um, yeah, maybe mammals and insects might have been a useless reference as far as pair, but the point just being, um, a comparison that they could both have feathers but still be different sorts of things okay uh, our next super chat is from vandali 1998 who for 999 us says nick if you don't think birds are dinosaurs do you think humans are mammals plus dapper if you're not having an after show i'm live with rj at 5 p.m edt if anyone wants to check it out uh so i will say this for the second part before we get into the question um vandali 1998 Please do feel free to put the link to your chat with RJ uh, in this chat. And uh, 5 p.m. is coming up in 13 minutes, guys. So, uh, Vandalia 1998, please put that link in the in the uh, chat so people can check that out if they want to. RJ Downer, of course, is the co-author of The Rocks Were There. He's the author of Evolution Slam Dunk, and he will be the co-author of The Rocks Were There Part 2. And as for the question, I will repeat it because it's been a little bit. Uh, so the question, Nick, is if you don't think birds are dinosaurs, do you think humans are mammals? Yeah, and I would say humans are mammals in that um, we define mammals based on milk producing and live birth typically, even though um, it seems that there's some exceptions to live birth, whether we would say marsupials are somewhat an exception or um, the platypus being an exception. But um, humans are not one of those exceptions, so that does not complicate it any. Um, I would also say that humans, we're like biophysically, we are animals, but we are not animals, right? Like um, there is something special about humans that makes them not merely animals or phys only physically animals, but it's not fair to say humans are animals. Is it? 
Yeah, that's it. And um, if we have a few more questions, um, I need to use the restroom just real quick. All right. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll take a thing. And I there is a I think there was a question for me, so I'm going to look and see. Does anyone have any questions for me, real quick? Especially not terribly controversial ones. While Nick is off, um, let me know. So um, I do agree. Um, I believe it was. I don't know who saw it, but who, someone who said uh, that was epic regarding the um, insect mammal thing. I I don't know what to say. It's it's sort of a no commentary uh, needed sort of situation. Um, yeah. Uh, also, by the way, guys, because um, Nicholas is going back on a bathroom break and we do have two more uh, questions that are super chatted. Chances are we won't actually be able to get more questions than those two unless they're directed directly at me. And it's a quick one. Um, if, so Charles Christensen said, if rocks had feathers, would rabbits lay eggs? Um, I don't think those two are causally related, so I'm going to have to say I don't think that would follow, no. Um, so what's the exact definition of dinosaurs? Uh, so dinosauria, there are two different ways to define uh, taxa. You can define them cladistically, and you can define them anatomically. So cladistically is the option I didn't uh, up to go with because it requires the assumption of common descent. But cladistically, dinosauria has traditionally been defined a number of ways. Uh, ways that I'm familiar with is um, the most recent common ancestor of uh, Megalosaurus and Iguanodon and all of its descendants. I've also heard um, Triceratops hortus and Tyrannosaurus rex used. I've also heard uh, Triceratops and Pastor domesticus used. Pastor domesticus is the, uh, the house finch. The anatomical definition is broadly what I gave in my opening, and it there are additional things like the uh, acute anterior lateral margin of the astragalus, but that's one of those things where it's like, at that point, you're getting more technical than I want to go for a discussion like this. But welcome back. I was just answering a few questions that um, had come in uh, for me, and also there was a question as to whether or not um, I had read Captain Gargoyle's super chat, which I believe I did. It said, Nick, you think sauropods are dinosaurs? Because they share the trait of dinos, well, so do birds. By what metric are they not all? Are birds not also dinosaurs? Did I read that one? Um, I remember something about sauropods, but I don't think it was exactly that. Well, if you'd like to answer maybe that question, I, go ahead. Maybe, maybe I missed it. Was. it. That was for five Canadian dollars. Yeah, because um, or maybe I just thought of it a little differently than how it was worded, but um. Yeah, if sauropods are dinosaurs, then how are birds not dinosaurs? Well, they were created at the same time, and there seems to be um, a big difference in what bird boneness is than what dinosaur boneness is. When we um, look at the birds in dinosaurs, even when they're similarly proportioned, there's kind of a large leap in... Um, what their bones look like. But then when dinosaurs change the proportions of their bones, they're like the same sort of bones, but in different proportions. And so um, we see that distinction. Now I do see how if someone were thinking of an evolutionary timeline, um, they might have a different perspective. Like, um, well, we just don't have fossils for the transition between non-bird dinosaurs and um, birds but um, when you, we know that they're made the same day and um, we don't really have reason to think that there is a transition there rather we just, I just see a difference okay um, all I really have to respond to is once again we have a contradiction here where Nicholas is saying that we can use the bone the similarity in the bones of um, sauropods to connect them to other dinosaurs but we can't do the same with birds apparently because we know too much about birds this does not follow it is it's not even a double standard it's it's a bizarre illogical nonsense to say that we can connect these two groups of animals based solely on osteology but this group over here we can't use osteology on because we have more than osteology to go on i mean it it's i don't even know how to describe how nonsensical that is but uh if you want a minute to respond to that go ahead Oh, yeah. Um, same thing as I said last time that. Um, oh, yeah, that it's possible that um, sauropods are not similar 
two dinosaurs in the way they look like they're probably similar. Um, so we don't actually know that. Okay. <clears throat> now, for the last two questions, unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring us down to two minute, one minute, 30 second instead of uh, three, two, uh, one. And that's just because um, we do have to wrap up pretty soon. Uh, we have Vandalia 1998 streams coming, and we still do have two more super chatted questions, which unfortunately means I'm not going to get to the non super chatted questions. Um, sorry, guys, that's just how it goes sometimes. Uh, so for five dollars from Ray, five US from Ray Cosby, uh, Nicholas, do you believe the behemoth and dragons and dinosaurs are the same? If so, don't you need a living example of all to do so? Um, the only one that there's a clear enough description of to know exactly what's being talked about is the, um, the behemoth, which is clearly a brachiosaur. Um, the Leviathan seems to have some specific things spoken about it, but also a lot of pretty fantastic things like fire breathing and that sort of thing. Um, it's not as clear what the Leviathan is. Um, I'm not even certain that that one is a physical animal um, because the behemoth is the one that God's bragging about his pinnacle physical animal creation. So um, yeah, the only one that's clear what it is exactly is the behemoth. Um, dragons would probably be the whole broad category of dinosaurs, but um, it may be that dragons were considered to be flying serpents, which might be um, pterodons or something. So I don't actually know for sure what dragons are. All right. Um, I think you guys have heard my spiel on whether or not Behemoth is a dinosaur. It just isn't. It's it's a laughable uh, assertion on the same level as saying that maybe insects might be mammals. There's just not a chance. Um, the description doesn't actually very well describe Brachiosaurus. And um, we have no evidence that people around then in the area that was, was written, which is, you know, in the mid, well, the ancient Near East, had ever encountered any non-avian dinosaurs. So it's a, insanely crazy to suggest that that is the most likely explanation until you actually find conclusive evidence that they would have even known what a brachiosaur was in the first place. And if you want, uh, Nick, you got 30 seconds. Yeah, well, there's not time to go over the scripture where the brachiosaur is described. But... Um... Yeah, and unfortunately, in the King James, there's a mistranslation where it says um, the sinews of his stones are stitched together, which um, is actually the sinew of his terror is stitched together, the terror being his tail, which just if you look at it in order to check it for yourself, that's a pretty important detail. All right, that was the um, 30 seconds. <clears throat> All right, and for our last question, which is going to be coming in for $20 redos from Pibothulu, Kibathulu asks, how does Nicholas slash Proclaimer explain or understand lake barbs that are of a thicker deposit than a mere 6,000 years would allow, or cultures that are unbroken for longer times than a mere 6,000 years? And it roboted you for a, oh, I'm an sorry. important I'll, syllable there. I'll repeat that question then. Uh, this is for $20 reduce from Pibathulu, who asks, how does Nicholas Proclaimer explain or understand lake barbs that are of a thicker deposit than a mere 6,000 years, or cultures that are unbroken for longer times than a mere 6,000 years. Okay, the lake what? Because it was almost the same syllable again, unfortunately. Barbs. I will type it in the private chat if that helps. I'm not sure if it will or not. Okay, that might help, yeah. It sounds like it goes silent there for a second, unless that's just the way the word is said. Varbs. So B-A-R-V-E-S. Like varbs that live in a lake? Uh, no, varbs are, in fact, a... Uh, so they are seasonal depositions that can be detected either in situ as they're forming with lake with, you know, drilling out bits of a lake, or you can also find them in lacustrine um, sediment deposits after they lithify. Oh, yeah. I um, don't regard them as annual layers at all. Um, the way. Yeah, so that's just an entirely different interpretation of what we're looking at. Um, is really all I can say on that. All right. Uh, well, my I mean, response my response to that is that 
we have known mechanisms for forming barbs annually. We can check with things like uh, uh, paleopollen records and things like that to check to see if they are, in fact, uh, annual. And while there are some lakes that do do more than annual barbs, you can check to see if they're annual or not by doing things like checking with pollen counts because different plants tend to only give off pollen at a certain time of the year. And you can tell based on which pollens are found in the lakes whether or not you're seeing annual cycles or not. And in most cases, we are seeing annual cycles. Uh, to believe otherwise, you have to simply be dishonest with the, audience, with the evidence or be ignorant of the evidence that exists. But with up to 30 seconds, and then we're going to say our final little bits where we can plug anything that we want to. Nick, take it away for up to 30 seconds. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well... I don't really have anything more to say, I think. All right, well, I'm coming from. in that case, uh, Nick, do you have anything that you would like to tell the audience about anything that's coming up, any links that you would like to me to send them? Because you can put them in the private chat here, and I will make sure they get into the description and the chat. Um, no, I mean, I'll be doing Bible studies more on my channel. So... Um, if you want to throw out the link to my channel, if anyone's been interested in Bible study, then absolutely, that's one thing that'll be going on. Um, also, um, I address the text very directly, um, not really from a denomination or anything like that. So you can step back from um, institutionalized perspectives, that kind of thing. So um, it can be a refreshing perspective as far as um yeah okay uh yeah please do get me that link and i will make sure that it goes into the description as well as put it in the chat for everyone who is currently here um as far as my channel goes as you guys know we have a kent with bent coming up on tuesday on thursday there should i believe i'm going to be uh releasing the second part of my international phonetic alphabet video uh then on saturday i'm going to be finishing up the um, Spirit Science History, which if you think Young Earth Creationism is bonkers, wait till you meet Jordan from Spirit Science. Yeah, it's crazy town. And then, of course, following that, and on the next Tuesday, there will be another Kent with Bent, and then part two of Canadian Creationists. I have no idea if there's anything going on on that Saturday following. Uh, but I think with that, we are going to get out of here. Uh, Nicholas, thank you very much once again for coming. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did, too. Uh, yeah, I had a good time. All right. Well, we're going to hit the end credits, and then we're going to get out of here. And um, Well, I guess I should disclaim to just say that I don't know if I, quote, represented my side very well. I just um, came to have an honest discussion and um, present where the angle that I addressed the topic from. But um, yeah, so, sorry to my side if I represented you guys poorly. But um, oh, I'm sure you'll hear came, about it from them if you did. Yeah, I, I came more for casual discussion than to be a representative of um, one who's prepared on these categories of discussion. You know, these topics. Yeah. All right. Well, bye, everybody. I just want to take a moment to thank my patrons and channel members especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bede, and Patrick Dennis. My patrons and channel members really help make this channel possible, and without them, this channel wouldn't exist. If you would like to support me, you can click the join link on this channel below this video, or you can click on my Patreon, link in the description, and pledge. On Patreon, there is an option for an annual subscription, which comes with a 10% discount. And joining the channel will give you access to my custom emojis. However, if a regular pledge isn't for you, I do have a merch store. And if monetarily helping out the channel isn't a thing you can do, every like, share, and comment really helps the channel.